Hello, my name is Annalie Carruthers, and I am the organizer of the Toyin Falola interviews. Welcome. Dr. Toyin Falola, globally renowned scholar and professor, is creating a new electronic series called the Toyin Falola interviews, which you see here today. In this series, Dr. Falola will interview scholars and policymakers whose work and research are particularly relevant for the African continent and its peoples, including the diaspora. Dr. Falola will also discuss the scholars' most recent books with them. The ultimate goal in this series is to promote the work of great minds and to spread knowledge to the general public about current intellectual projects that these great minds are pursuing. Research themes can include, but are not limited to the following, African affairs, African migration, religion, culture, intellectual history, development issues, theories, women's rights, disability rights, post-colonial society in Africa and other parts of the global south, and globalization. These discussions will be recorded over Zoom, and these recordings will be distributed on the Toyin Falola Network Facebook page, Twitter, and website. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you enjoy. published widely on so many subjects, each of which um, represents a discipline. So you can work in so many departments, economics and finance and religion and philosophy. So you've done so many essays, 20 major books. Uh, so people wonder, why are you so eclectic? How do these ideas come to you? And where does your muse come from? The, the, the first thing about working in several fields is that one thing I tell myself, I work on only those things that excite me, that, that have the passion to excite me. I don't, um, so I work on those things that will excite me. So if something doesn't catch my interest, if something doesn't move me, uh, if, if a book does not write itself, itself in my being, I don't try to do it. And that's for one reason why I've never signed a contract, a book contract before I write a book. And because I don't want somebody's pressure, somebody's timetable. I'll always work out a book first before I submit a proposal. That will make the uh, publishing process longer, but I just feel that I should be left alone to think through an issue without any time pressure, without somebody telling me an agenda, this is what we're doing. I always work on that. So if I work on so many things, it's, it's because my passion, the way ideas come and uh, grab me or the way I, I grab grabs are there um, move me to write on so many things. But um, historically, I'm also a product of a deliberate experiment that was done in Nigeria. I, I went to the University of Potakot in 1980, um, in the fall 1980. At that time, the, the head of the social science, the School of Social Science, was Claude Ake. It was called school, not faculty. And the idea at that time was that if Africa was, uh, was going to develop, then we need to produce graduates that are not one trick pony, uh, one trick ponies. That that um, university education was so expensive to just narrowly specialize anybody. So Claude Ake, uh, Izimiro, and uh, Kim So Koko, and, and others that were there, uh, Walter Olo. All this were there came up with the idea of a school system where, in the first two years, you you study all the social sciences. So I have to take courses in geography, in uh, economics, in, even though my major was in economics, in political science, in sociology, anthropology. I did all that, and then you have to even take a, a course in science, history. And, and so the, the idea that was that when you go to work for the government, you work somewhere in the ministry, at least you 
you are not so narrowly focused that you cannot define African Africa's problem in its complexity and diversity. That's what they were aiming for. So, so they buy that on uh, into us, and we imbibed it. They, they put that onto us, and we imbibed it. And they asked us to read very widely to to engage ideas. And so that has followed me to this point of engaging ideas, going for the truth of whatever I can find it. And if, if, if I happen to walk on a path of truth and I find out that, uh oh, I need anthropology or I need the history, I, I, I need political theory to understand it better than where, where I started, then I educate myself in that. So is, is, is the quest for the truth, is, is, is the quest to engage problem, African problems, whether at the theoretical level, at the abstract level, or at the concrete level that is responsible for me working in this field. So that I need to, I don't want to forget. So I do that. So, so, so what is it? Reading a lot, studying, studying other people, having the discipline to pay attention to details, to every details in the environment, what, 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 what is happening to environment, listening to people and, and and not just reading them but read, read them closely so that you can learn something uh, uh, from them and um, and then be open to receiving ideas because if you're not open to receiving ideas if you think you have known everything then ideas uh, will not come to you so i'm always open to receiving ideas. whether whether the person is the most brilliant person in the world or or the um the person everybody con con consider is a village idiot but and I listen to people. And I'm always looking for what I will learn uh, from them. I've not met any human being that I consider myself smarter or brighter. My policy is that I consider everybody smarter and brighter than me. Therefore, I can learn something from that human being. That's very wonderful. And that shows an aspect of your humility as well. But there is a body of your work on Pentecostalism. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been privileged to read many of them. So uh, Pentecostalism today is um, under some criticism in Nigeria uh, regarding tight payments, the wealth of um, major leaders like Bakari, Edebo, Adeboye, and some people are saying they should clip their wings, um, the amount of money they control. So uh, I, I think we have to ask you on these practical questions, uh, like, like um, as if people are now beginning to question the practices and messages of these Pentecostalist leaders, framing them as part of the Nigerian corrupt system. What would you, how would you respond to that criticism? At the personal level, that people acquire obviously acquire stupendous wealth. Um, if I were a leader, that would not be, be my style because I don't think that exactly reflects what Jesus Christ would have done. Um, and and, uh, and and so so one has to be very careful the way it's not that wealth is is um, is yeah, is bad, but if you are a leader and you are trying to emulate Jesus Christ, you have to be very careful that money or wealth is not the primary image people see because that has an ish issue because when people begin to associate the the religion with money, like um, this morning, I was discussing with with people, and we look at Acts chapter eight, where Peter rebuked Simon. He said, "He said the gifts of God cannot be bought with money." So, but so when leaders begin to display wealth in that way, knowingly or unknowingly, the mind begin to make some of their followers to associate uh, faith, holiness, with money, that. The more money you have, the more holy you are. If you are, if you are holy, it translates into wealth. Now, it doesn't always work that way. I have said that, but that is a problem deeply rooted in Christianity. 
people want to deny it. And, and I could easily give you uh, three, um, three examples. When the missionaries came to Africa, one of the ways they sold Christianity was that, look at what our gods have done for us. We have more technology. We are more powerful. That kind of thinking over time um, could, could lead to this. I'm not saying it's a direct but it could see the association of, of material powers, material power, wealth, technological power with the God that you worship is deeply rooted in, 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 in Christian history. Second, if you look at even Max Weber's book on Protestant ethics and the spirit of capitalism, um, basically it started from the foundation of, of, of Calvinism that um, people are, some people are destined uh, predestined to be saved, but we don't know. But is that from that book, you get the idea that is your material achievement, your commitment to work, your commitment to be somebody is an indication of 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 your chosenness of your of, of your predestined. So even though it's not that correlation is not as strong as you find in prosperity gospel, but it's there. The third example I will, I will I will give. I tell people. Even in the mainline churches in America or in Nigeria, I said, how many of you have put on your church board a homeless man or, or a poor man? What anytime you want to look for people to be on church board, financial board, so, so you always pick successful men and women. Now, by that implicit, you are, because that is a spiritual post, you are making the um, assertion implicitly that those who are rich ought to occupy higher positions in the church. And, and, and so that creates a, 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 yeah, yeah, a, yeah, a problem. This is not to um, excuse what is happening in, in Pentecostalism, but, I, but I'm saying that if we are aware of this kind of connections or this kind of temptation in Christianity, then certain leaders need to take more precaution in the way they, they make any connection or make people to see connection between wealth and spirituality. And, and, and so, so that, that's what, what, what I would say. Yeah, in 2014, you, you wrote a book on Nigerian Pentecostalism, mm -hmm. uh, published by the University of Rochester Press. And one of the key characteristics you identify, identify in that book is what you call the spell of the invisible. The spell of the invisible. Can you explain what it means and why this is a key to understanding the Nigerian variety of Pentecostalism? Yes. Um, what I meant in that book, what I meant by the spell of the invisible, that in Nigerian Pentecostalism, the, the propelling force seems to be, how do I understand what is behind the veil? So, so we have the phenomenology, right? The, the physical world, but it's, it's not enough. We have to understand what is behind the veil, right? That, 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 that what is happening to us in the physical is always controlled by the invisible, what we don't see. And so the role of the, of the pastor, the role of a good Christian is to crack that wall and know what is behind. And, and so that is, what drives you so if you are poor it's not so much about your hard work or lack of hard work it's what some enemy some spiritual force has done to block you if you can't have, have a, uh, a baby it's not because your husband is impotent or has a low sperm count or, or you have other problems the, the issue is that somebody has caused that barrenness so we are always looked we're always moving from the physical to, to, to the non-physical, to the spiritual realm, that which is invisible, as a form of causation. Now, um, and the problem with Pentecostalism in this respect is a carryover from African traditionalism. The carryover is not a problem, but they've, they've run with it to a different level. But in, in Pentecostalism, so the first order is dealing with the physical laws as all of us can understand it. Every human being understand and you have the spiritual way. And so it, also in African traditional religion, you have this first order acquisition and they move to the second order. They can't 
they, they are not permanently living at the second order uh, uh, condition. They're not first order. Like if a man sleeps with a woman, she'll get pregnant. That is a first order condition. You don't need spirit to tell you. Or if you if you climb a tree, if you if you and and if you let go, you fall down. They knew that. And Pentecostalism knew that very well. But what has happened in Pentecostalism is that the second order condition, the flight, the jump in, into second order has overwhelmed everything. As if there is no more first order condition, there is no more physical world to deal with. They've jumped, you know, headlong into the second order. So everything becomes a second order uh, uh, position. Even if there is no fuel in your car, that you know that the first order, it didn't put you no fuel, you ran out of fuel, or your gas tank was leak, leaking, they will jump to, oh, there's a spiritual cause. And that is a deadly form of irrationality, a very dilapidating form of irrationality. And that is where they've taken this spell of invisible. To under So in that book, I was trying to alert people of this concern that if you really want to understand Nigerian Pentecostalism, you got to pay attention to the spell of invisible. And it's not just enough to say, well, this is something what we had in African traditional religion or what we have in in another spiritual situation, but they have taken it to the end level and it does not make sense anymore because nothing, therefore nothing is real. Um, yeah, again, as if they are not dealing in the physical, but whether they like it or not, they're always situated in the physical world and they have to deal with the laws, laws of physics as it is or the laws of nature, but they've, they've kind of shunted out of that of that place, and that is what I was trying to. I, I was using this lens, this commitment to the invisible, as a way to explain a lot of what um, their practices and their ideas and their doctrines. So, thank you very much. Uh, that's a wonderful answer. Are you going, is your next book on Pentecostalism, or what would that be? Well, um, I have two books coming out next month, and um, so one is called the Split economy where I'm, I'm looking at uh, capitalism and the history of, uh, of, of, of economies to, to look at what causes imbalances in um, economic performance um, um, from, from, from time immemorial and trying to theorize that uh, to the beginning and therefore understand why there's so much imbalance in the financial uh, uh, world or so. And, and, and in that process, showing that some of these imbalances that Karl Marx and Marxists thought that was as a result of capitalism, I'm saying that they preceded capitalism. So that is the, called the, um, the split economy. Then the other book that's coming out also in, in November, if not this, this, this month, even though I wrote that one later, I call it the, the Pentecostal hypothesis. And the subtitle is Christ talks, then they decide. And in that book, I'm trying to understand, um, put forward the theory of Pentecostal epistemology. And um, it says, um, and, and I got the idea from an uh, African woman uh, um, in New York, actually from River State, a, a, a clever woman, who had the idea, she summarized it, said, it makes, it does not make sense, but it makes spirit. So when people take Pentecostal take certain action, she is saying, look, the way to understand it that it might not make sense, it doesn't make sense, means it might not make sense at the realm of, of, of the physical, at the phenomenological level, but it may make, make sense at this spiritual level. So you see, it goes back to this thing I was talking about, the spell of invisible. Right? So, so that lays out a form of epistemology. And if, if you look at it, it does not make sense, but it, it makes spirit, that's what she put it. Those are nine words. And one of the things that I, I find it so far fascinating that in trying to unpack our nine words, I wrote a book of um, over 200 pages close to that, just to unpack the wisdom in, in the way it sums up the epistemology. But in also doing that, I was in a way back of my head, I was also doing something to say an African woman, a pastor who is not a philosopher, who is not a scholar, but is a learned person, can formulate a philosophical thought. By the way, the woman's name is um, um, Pastor Elsie 
uh, Obed. That is what, so that is good recommendation. But in, in terms of the project I'm working on, which I intend to finish maybe by, by the end of this year, it's like, like I said at the beginning of the interview, it's a book on economic philosophy, trying to craft a viable economic philosophy for African economy development based on indigenous, religious, and philosophical thought. So that is my next uh, project that I'm, I'm working on. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, your country, Nigeria, also my country, just turned 60. I'm reading through all the various um, reflections. One can see the expressions of agonies and disappointment. Can we not argue that we are overcritical, that the country is young at 60 years? Um, or can we say that we've had um, many lost opportunities? Or can we say that um, we are the victims of self-destruction? Uh, I have a friend who always say that if you pay somebody, a contractor to destroy Nigeria, that contractor would not have done a good job as Nigerians are doing themselves, destroying their own country. What would be your own reflections on um, this country at 60? Um, the image that, when it, um, I mean, with, um, we are just now over October 4th, so our independence celebration was only um, three days ago. And when I reflect on, on the country, and the image, a painting came to my mind that I think captures Nigeria. And I've used that um, image of the painting uh, talked about it in my book, Ethics and Society in Nigeria, is, is the painting by Paul Klee, uh, Paul K-L-E-E, -E. it's called Angelus uh, Novus, or the Angel of History. And in that painting, Paul Glee's uh, Angelus Novus uh, painting, you have an angel about to fly fly off, so his, his wings are stretched, it, it has caught the, uh, the wind, the wings are stretched, and so it, um, but he's backing the fissure, and his his gaze is cast on the debris debris of history, right? So he's, he's looking at the debris of history, and the wind is supposed to blow him to uh, uh, to the uh, to, to the future. But yet he's, he's backing the future, and he's so fascinated by the debris in front of him that he's caught in that moment of of as if about to fly off. Everything is ready, but he can yeah he couldn't uh, fly. And that is where Nigeria is, right? So we have, as you said, we have destroyed our country so much that the debris of history, the debris of our heritage, the debris of our missed opportunities, of our the developmental chances have so piled up that it has, it has not caught our, our attention, our future. And we are backing our future instead of um, back in the debris and say, how do we move forward? So the wind is there, cut up. And that is the story of Nigeria. There's always the wind, the potentiality in that country to learn. And as if our wings are stretched, but yet we cannot look away from the corruption, from the debris, from the ethnicity, from, from irrationality, from all the things that we do, it has, it has caught onto our gaze and we are ready to fly but then we are backing uh, the, the, the official thing. That picture captures Nigeria until somebody comes around and maybe slaps the face of the angel and turn him to say, what has ever had happened had happened, the, 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 this, you are, your wings are ready, fly into the future. And I think it's a leader or a group of citizens that will come out and play that revolutionary role. And that is why I, I wrote my uh, the book, Ethics and Society in Nigeria, Identity, History, and Political Theory, is to express that optimism that there's a generation that needs to come. And some of the critics said I was too optimistic. But what, what could anybody do in Nigeria? You, you have to be uh, uh, somewhat be, be opt, uh, you're optimistic. And we also know that civilization or countries fail and disappear. That's an option, but without disregarding that, 
that, that um, countries can fail and disappear, civilization can go. One, at least at any moment in time, have to exercise hope that one day things will happen. But it appears the present generation and the one before and whatever, probably have lost it. And, and so there's a, a new seed that needs to arise, a new uh, world that needs to turn around that, that angel represents Nigeria. And we need a new force to say, turn your face and move. The wings are up. Thank you very much. Um, you are a family man. I visited your house and um, when you received the chair at Boston University, it was a glorious moment. The people came from far and wide. Uh, some people even came from Nigeria. So how do you balance your teaching load, administration, every writing, uh, schedule with family work and, and, and children, child raising, community and things like that. I sacrifice a lot outside mm -hmm. in the sense that um, I hardly have time to go to the movies. I, I don't drink, I don't smoke and I don't socialize much. So, 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 I, so, so many things that people do um, or take for granted, I don't enjoy those pleasures because if I try to do all that with my academic work and my family, I'm not going to um, go very far. So I've, I've deliberately made the choice that there are certain lifestyle or certain things that one just have to give up, right? So um, I've been in this country I came to this country as a student since 1990, but I don't think um, I've ever been to the beach, even though I grew up near the ocean, near the river. Uh, that is not a, a luxury. It, it probably in the last 10 um, or 15 or more years, since the um, uh, 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 Passion of the Cross, the Passion of Christ came out, probably that is the um, last time, or one other time that probably I've been to to a movie hall. Once in a while, uh, I, I could watch a movie on, on TV or so. so. So there are many things that one has given up in order to create the time um, to do my academic work with my family. And so the, the academic work actually um, gives me time to be at home and, and attend to the needs of my uh, family when they rise. But the, the good thing about this, life is that, um, and ability is that I have this spouse who I pay me who has been very supportive in that uh, respect, because you need, you need a family, the kind of family or spouse that would let you have the space uh, uh, to, 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 to do your academic work. Because academic work is a very lonely job. You know, you, you don't, you sleep late and, and, you, and you wake up late, you know, and and, and so, so, so that is the, the, the blessing and the grace that I've attended my academic work and my family life. Thank you uh, for your patience. This will be my last question. And it's about the job people. Um, it's an area that I think is one of the richest in the continent. And it has always been so historically. Um, during the Atlantic slave trade, the slave raiders and traders poached on that area. That bite produced over 2 million slaves feeding the Americas. And when that trade stopped and they began to trade in raw materials, what they named so-called legitimate trade, it became the source of palm canal, palm oil. And by the 20th century, one of the world's leading supplier of palm oil in the 50s, that same area, they discovered oil. And since um, 1967, it has been the life wire, the main revenue source of the country. That's one level, a very rich area, very blessed, very endowed. I call it a geological anomaly in terms of what we have been able to get from it. Then comes the other side. 
Uh, there is one of the poorest in the country. I've been there many times. I once visited them um, some places to know more, no transportation. We took him um, Keno. Uh, even where the former president of Nigeria, Jonathan, comes from, it's difficult to access. Many areas are difficult to access. I wanted to attend the funeral ceremony of your mom. I knew how to get there, but I didn't know how to get back because flying, I was to fly from Cameroon to Abuja, attend and go back. So, and people say, look, this is not as easy as you're putting it. And I unfortunately I had to cancel. And one time I went to the market in Port Harcourt with a friend of mine who wanted to make soup, okra and gari. And the gari was so expensive, the okra was so expensive. Uh, it was as if you are buying gas for your, uh, petrol for your car. And I asked myself, how can people live like this? The farmlands are devastated. The environment is polluted. So this, this is a story of Nigeria regarding distribution of power, federalism and abuses of federalism, um, the, the management of the country. Then you have the news this year of um, how the corporation created to redress some of these balances has also become an agency of corruption in which it's the just citizens themselves who are given this money to manage, who are also mismanaging their people. So you have the foreign companies creating their own problems, the Nigerian states creating their own problems, uh, your governors and managers creating their own problems, some chiefs and uh, local leaders creating their own problems. When we combine all this, first, in Pentecostalist terms, is a cost imposed on the job people that they will never make it? Or is this a straightforward political economy? Or is it a function of restructuring the country and creating the Niger Delta as a separate country? Or, or should we not be bothered by this? Uh, thank you, sir. Um, that is an excellent question. And the issue or the problem of the suffering of the Ijo people or, or the Niger Delta people in general is something that have touched me very deeply. I remember when I was doing my PhD work just before my uh, comprehensive ex exam, I've, I've gone to a, a, a Puerto Rico with a, with a friend from America to do some charity work and also do some, um, 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 talk to some of the pastors there. And what I saw at, at that time, I've been away, I think I've not been to Puerto Rico for seven years or so. And what I saw and the level of poverty and the injustice that I saw, I nearly, I came back, I nearly abandoned my PhD. I said, what is the point of studying? Now, it, that me studying at Princeton, this is a big luxury that my people are dying or, or yeah, yeah, or so what, what is the point of this uh, sophisticated knowledge that I'm getting one needs to do something. It took me a lot of time to come out from that anyway, to, 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 to come out and continue with stuff. So, so that is something that, that, that touched me. And I, I grew up in that setting, that suffering, that oil was taken away not far from where I live and everything, but then there was no electricity or so, and you see the gas, um, the gas being burnt away, there was no, um, good drinking water, the, 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 uh, the, the rivers has been polluted, you know, everything has, has turned, to be, uh, turned out to be very expensive to buy. Life was difficult and it, it's, it's under those um, circumstances that one, one grew, uh, grew up. So, but it's not a matter of, 
it's not a matter of cost. It's, it, it's, 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 it's the nature of the political economy that, that we're in. And, and so one thing, like, like I said, the Ethics and Society of Nigeria, my, um, my book that came out last year, was to show to the Ijo people that they have resources in their own history to enable them resist bad government. To, to, to enable them resist bad government. And, and, and this is something because when I was growing up, we had a, a saying, and anthropologists re, 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 got at it. And they said, when a, a god becomes too demanding, become too furious, we the people will tell the god from which wood it was cut from. Right? They will tell the god that we, uh, we, uh, we carved you. And so this, we all grew up hearing that, and I know Robin Hutton wrote about this in books, but no, no one thought it was just a program until one day, 2009 or, or so, uh, around um, July, I was in, in the Slave Museum in Liverpool, going through the archives, doing all that research, and I came across this diary of a, a white sailor who was there in, in Calabari when in 1857, the, 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 the town gathered and um, began to kill sharks because shark was a representative of one of the gods. And they now told the white men, everybody can now eat shark, you can kill shark. And the white man said, no, before you, you could say sharks are sacred, no, they said, he said, no, that shark have, have turned out to be eating our children. And therefore, we cannot worship that. Uh, so he cannot be one of our gods in our pet, uh, pantheon. So they now decided to desacralize sharks. And, and they justify it on this proverb that if a god becomes too furious, too demanding, we will tell him from which wood we carved that god from. Which means that if our politicians become senseless today, if our ancestors 150 years ago, 170 years ago, could kill their own gods. And when I researched it more, I found out that other Ijo groups to have the tradition of killing their gods. And for the fact that you, a, a god is a god does not mean that human beings in the Ijo tradition cannot kill the god. They will literally kill the god and say, you are, you are no more and you have no stuff. And, and, but you see, the, 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 the way he started their question about the slave trade, also, when I learned that in 1857, they, they, they killed their gods off and then shared the meat and ate it and said, this god is no more god also because the god has failed to live up to his covenant. But one thing was, I think it has a question, said these people have had this god for hundreds of years before 1857. What really happened that all of a sudden, shock as a symbol of their god turned against them? You know what happened? And this is going back to the slave, uh, slave trade. That in the whole, in over 300 years of that slave trade, sharks have learned to follow the ships into the creeks. In the past, sharks were mainly ocean sea, but during the era of slave trade, the European ships were used to throwing dead bodies on the sea. And so I went to historical records and began to find out that uh, they were throwing this in, and even they were recording that because of that, sharks begin to follow ships into the uh, creek, right? Because they expect some bodies to be, and doing that over 300 years, move the shark from the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, down into the creek where they were then encountering human beings. So by that 1857, I guess they've had it enough that the um, um, sharks were killing people. Remember, in that part of the world, the slave trade was still going on up to that 1857. And they now decide to kill the shark. So you see, so, so that very, so, so you see the impact of the slave trader, it upturned also their, their, their religious worldview or their belief. And also in one of my essays, I called the disappearance of women in, in Calabari, it also changed their number system. What they regard, which numbers are violent, which numbers are positive, and the violence number in the adjust system begin to take a, a, a preeminence. So, why is this history important? Is to show that no matter the degradation or the oppression, these people always had resources to rise up. 
And that's one of the things I wrote in that book that we need to learn from the Jews and the Jews need to learn from their own history to say, this present gods that rule Nigeria in terms of politicians, we the people can tell them, we made them. But the way they did it right, is, is very important. The way they did it, they said, when they were doing it, they said, if each one of us attack the God alone, one one, the God will de de defeat us. But if we collectively band up together, we will defeat every God. So they banded up together. And when they shared the meat of the of the of the God, of the shark, to show their commitment, of course, there will be, there will be some people that will not eat the the meat of, of, of the God. So they, so they put the blood of the shark into the in, in, into the town well. So everybody by that commitment, you are we all engage um uh, in the God and they disbanded the priesthood for that God. So, so, so what does that tell us? This idea of collective action. So if the people can come together and collectively resist, it is not a matter of cause or anything. It's a matter of having um, centuries of bad rulers. And, and if you read one of the things that Peter Eke, um, not his famous thing about two public systems, but his work tracing why the state is antagonistic to his people. You know, he, the Eke showed that that the the African state being involved in, in slave trade and things have always been antagonistic to his people in in, in, in most cases in the in the recent history, especially in that part of the world. And the people have, have been so removed uh, 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 from the government. So this issue we are seeing right from the slave trade to the legitimate, uh, no, the pre-slave trade to the legitimate trade. Uh, to the slave trade, to the legitimate trade, to, to colonialism, to post-colonialism, and to where we are in Nigeria, has always been a case of a ruling class that have taken its interest over and above uh, the, the people by means of capturing state power and using it as a means of accumulation, for primitive accumulation. And that is things that somebody like Claude Ake theorized a long time ago. We are caught in that web. And in Jaws, the Ninja Delta happened to be the poster boy because we have always had the resources. And so when you are dealing with a, a predatory state, when you're dealing with a, a ruling class that wants to capture state power, if you happen to be the region that has the resources, you are going to pay a heavy price because the ruling class in Africa, especially the ruling class in Nigeria, have not learned to say we can create more wealth. And if you create more wealth, probably we we even have more to steal, or we can use market principle to grow. They've not gotten the sense that it suits ultimately will suit their interests if they let the economy grow and people flourish. But they're caught in this, like like the angel we, we talk about the the angel of history that cut in the debris, they are cut focusing on the short term, they are cut focusing on, on corruption, and they can't turn around and take flight into the future. And, and so, so I think that's what is happening in the Ijo area. Thank you very much. We've covered a lot of grounds from, we started with Ijo people and we've closed this interview with Ijo people. Uh, we'll look at your scholarship uh, with a focus on Pentecostalism. And we look forward to reading your two forthcoming books. Thank you very much. You are very good. <laughs>